Well, thank you for letting me come and, and share with you this morning. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here. I think this is the second time that, that we've been in a meeting here in this building, uh, but the first time speaking, as far as I can remember. And uh, we're, we're a little flock here this morning, aren't we? But Jesus specifically encouraged little flocks. He said, fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And so we have great encouragement here this morning that God's grace is towards us. He's for us as a little flock, and He desires to give us the kingdom. And everything that goes along with that, growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, why don't we pray once more before we look into the Word. Father, we do thank You this morning for Your, for your grace, marvelous, infinite, matchless grace freely bestowed on all who believe. And we pray that You would pour out afresh this morning the Spirit of grace and supplication and the knowledge of You, that You'd strengthen us by Your power, in the inner man, Lord, fill us afresh with the love of Christ. Fill us afresh with faith and with Your Holy Spirit. Open Your Word to us now. I pray that You'd help us to sift the chaff from the wheat. Hold fast to that which is good. And Lord, reveal Yourself to us through Your Word today. Thank You for Jesus. Thank You for the good news of the Gospel that Christ died for sinners, that He rose again and that our faith doesn't rest on some flimsy foundation, but on the solid rock of the blood and righteousness of another. Please bless us now, in Christ's name, amen. Well, today we're going to be considering an account from the life of Jesus from John chapter 11 that I find to be especially instructive, helpful, challenging, and encouraging, kind of all rolled into one. And of course, there's enough content in John 11 for months of sermons, so what I want to do this morning is simply focus in on a few particular details in this passage and draw some lessons and applications from it. But before we get to John 11 itself, I want to first remind you of two foundational principles that we need to keep in mind whenever we consider an account from the life of Jesus in the Gospels. Two foundational principles that ought to be there any time we consider an account from the life of Christ. First of all, that Jesus Christ is the brightest and clearest revelation to us of what God is like. He's the brightest and the clearest revelation that we have as to the character of God. The single most important question that a person can ask is, does God exist? Because that question determines everything else in your life, right? Does God exist? But once you answer the existence question, the next question that you must ask becomes extremely urgent. Namely, what is God like? It's one thing to say, yes, God exists, but if the God who exists is a ruthless, selfish, loveless, joyless tyrant, then it would be better if he didn't exist in the first place. So how can you find out what he is like? And the answer is, we can't find out what God is like. He's the creator. We are the creature. There's an infinite gap between us and in God. He is holy, 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 totally separate, totally other, separate from His creation. We can't find out what God is like unless He condescends to reveal Himself to us. And of course, that's exactly what He has done. He's revealed Himself through His creation. Psalm 19, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Day to day pours forth speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. Romans 1, since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. So God has revealed Himself to His creation, us, through the created order, through the created world. 
but he's also revealed himself even more clearly through his word, the Bible, the Holy Scriptures. The Apostle Paul said that all Scripture is God-breathed, right? It's breathed out by God in order to reveal God to us. But not all parts of the Bible are equally detailed and clear when it comes to revealing to God, revealing himself to mankind. His revelation of himself was progressive. It occurred in stages, kind of like a sunrise coming up over the horizon. First there's a little sliver of light, and then there's a little more light until the full sun has arisen, blazing forth light in truth. And beloved, it's no accident that in Luke chapter 1, the Lord Jesus Christ is referred to as the sunrise from on high. Because it's in the Lord Jesus Christ that God has revealed himself in the fullest and clearest way imaginable. Listen to Hebrews 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. Exact representation of his nature, of his character. John 1.18, no one has seen God at any time. Period. <laughs> the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. No one's ever seen God, but the only begotten God in the bosom of the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. He has explained him. And so I say again that Jesus is the brightest and clearest revelation to us of what God is like. So any time that we read an account from the life of Christ, we, we must keep that in mind. To see him is not simply to see what a first century Jewish man is like. To see him is to see what God is like in the brightest and clearest way imaginable. He has explained him. By his words, his actions, his attitudes, his movements, where he went and where he didn't go, <laughs> he has explained him. John 14, Jesus simply says, He who has seen me has seen the Father in the brightest and clearest way. So that's the first foundational principle that I want us to keep in mind before we get to John 11 this morning. The second foundational principle is this that the same Jesus in John 11 is the same Jesus who is seated right now on the throne of the universe, reigning and ruling as our King and great High Priest. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 1. And I'll be reading this morning from the New American Standard. And I, I should have thought of that. I should have brought my ESV, but I just didn't even think of it, so apologize for that. But Acts chapter 1 and verse 9 referring to the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is speaking to His disciples after His resurrection. And then in verse 9, after He had said these things, He was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received Him out of their sight. He's gone, lifted up, ascended into heaven. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while He was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them, they also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, notice the phrase, this Jesus, the very one who went up, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. But notice that phrase, this Jesus, the same Jesus that went up, is the same Jesus who's there right now, and He's the same Jesus who is coming down again at the end of the age. The same one. Hebrews 13.8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, why is this important? Because we're not living 2,000 years ago when Jesus physically walked on the earth. We're living right now in 2015, and we need to know what Jesus is like right now. We need to know what is He like now. If He is the exalted King who rules over every particle and person from His throne in heaven, 
then we need to know what he is like. What kind of a ruler is he? If he's our great high priest who we should fly to in time of need, then we need to know what he's like. What kind of a high priest is he? If he's the savior of mankind who every person here this morning is invited to embrace, then we need to know what he is like. What kind of a savior is he? What's he like? And thankfully, we don't have to guess at the answers to these questions because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We can be absolutely certain that whatever aspects of Christ's person and character that we see today in John 11, or any other passage for that matter, whatever aspects of his person and character that we see in the scriptures are still true of him right now as he rules and reigns from his throne at the Father's right hand. The same Jesus who welcomed little children into his arms still welcomes little children into his arms. He's the same Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, keeping those two things in mind then, that he's the, the highest, clearest, brightest revelation of what God is like, and secondly, that he's the same Jesus here in the Scriptures as he is right now in the throne of the universe. Keeping those two things in mind, let's turn to John chapter 11. So John 11, and before we get into the specifics here, we'll just read most of the chapter to kind of get an overview. John chapter 11 and verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. This he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Therefore Thomas, who was called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, so that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. So Jesus shows up, Bethany, Lazarus' sister, Martha, runs out to meet him. Verse 21, Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I have be believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. When she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met him. 
Then the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. And so then Lazarus' other sister, Mary, runs out to meet Jesus. Verse 32, Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Same thing Martha had said. <laughs> Right? When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man also from dying? So Jesus, again being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done be believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. Now this is an amazing, and I would say shocking, section of Scripture. We begin by learning that Lazarus is sick. And Lazarus' sisters knew Jesus well enough to know that he was the only one who would be able to help. And so they send word to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And so we learn right there that Jesus has a special love for Lazarus. Lazarus is a close personal friend of the Lord. This isn't just some stranger that they're asking him to help. Something, someone that Jesus knows personally and has a special love and affection for. But not only that, Jesus apparently has a special love for this entire family. Notice back in verse 5, it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. He had a special love for the entire family. Not just Lazarus individually, but the whole family. But here's where it gets shocking. Notice in verse 6. So, when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Do you hear that? Jesus hears that Lazarus is deathly ill, so of course he takes off immediately and goes to heal Lazarus, right? It's not what it says. He stays right where he is for two more days. And that is not exactly the 911 response time that Martha and Mary had hoped for. I guarantee you. But notice also what comes out when you put verses 5 and 6 together. Verse 5, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Do you hear that? Jesus loved so he stayed. He loved, so he stayed. In other words, it was because Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus that he stays put and lets Lazarus die. And if that's not shocking enough, look at what Jesus says to the disciples who are traveling with him in verse 14. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may believe. Let us go 
to him. Again, I say this is kind of shocking. Jesus is glad that Lazarus is dead? Does that sound like the Jesus that you know? What's going on here? And of course, we know how the story ends. Martha runs out to meet Jesus. Mary runs out to meet him. And they both say the exact same thing. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And I can't help, I'm reading into this a little bit, but I can't help but think that that was meant to sting a little bit when they said that. They're hurting. They knew Jesus could have done something about it. They're hurting. Their brother's dead. Lord, if you had been here, you wouldn't have died. But before we get too upset with Martha and Mary, I think we would have to admit that we ourselves have often said, or at least thought, the same thing at times, haven't we? Lord, if you had been here, I would not have lost my job. Lord, if you would, had been here, that friend wouldn't have stabbed me in the back. Lord, if you had been here, my marriage wouldn't have fallen apart. Lord, if you had been here, this situation wouldn't have spun out of control. Lord, if you had been here, my child wouldn't have been born with a chronic health condition. Lord, if you had been here, we wouldn't have suffered those miscarriages. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But thankfully, the story doesn't end there. Of course, Jesus eventually makes his way to the tomb. Lazarus is raised from the dead after being in the grave four days. Now, how does this portion of Scripture apply to us? What are we supposed to learn from this? And Well, what I want to do this morning is I wanted to submit to you that what we really see here, at least in part, what we see here in John 11 is a picture of how trials and tribulations function in the life of the Christian. A lot of other things going on too, but I think that's something we see in this passage. We see how trials and tribulations function in the life of the believer. In Acts 14, the Apostle Paul says, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Just a certainty. And then that verse that Chad had mentioned this morning in John 16, Jesus just says, in the world, you have tribulation. <laughs> he doesn't say we might have tribulation in the world. as you do. You have tribulation. It's just the fact of the matter. It's the reality of living as a Christian in the midst of a fallen world. You have tribulation. But here in John 11, we get a glimpse behind the curtain, as it were. In John 11, we move beyond the simple fact that trials and tribulations happen to the Christian, and we move into the territory of the who and the how and the why of the trials and tribulations. Who is behind these trials? How are they brought into our lives, and why? And even though we need to be careful of coming up with some kind of one-size-fits-all solution to our trials that we face, I do think there are some foundational lessons that are brought out here in John 11 that can help us to understand more biblically, more faithfully, the tribulations that we have faced, are facing, and will face throughout our lives. And so I want to consider five of those lessons with the rest of our time here this morning. Five lessons from John 11 that I hope will help us to better understand the trials in our lives. And the first lesson is this. Very simple, but very hard to submit to sometimes. Lesson number one is that Jesus is in control of our life's circumstances. He's in control of our life's circumstances. Jesus could have left immediately when he heard that Lazarus was sick. He could have, but he didn't. Martha and Mary were right at least to a degree, if Jesus had been there, Lazarus likely would not have died. But Jesus wasn't there, and he wasn't there by his own choosing. And that can be a hard truth to accept. When you're in the midst of that suffering, when you're in the midst of that pain and hurt, it's a hard truth to accept that Jesus wasn't there by his own choosing. 
But the bottom line is that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to allow things to come into our lives that are not very pleasant. And when those difficulties come, we dare not think that they have come because Jesus dropped the ball. <laughs> no. It's precisely because he's in control and he's bringing these things into our lives for a purpose. That's why those things have come into our lives. Not because he dropped the ball. It's just the opposite of that. He's in control of those circumstances. And he's bringing them into our lives for a purpose, a good purpose, a loving purpose, as we'll see here in a moment. So the first lesson here is that Jesus is in control of our life's circumstances. He works all things, beloved, all things after the counsel of his own will. Lesson number two, Jesus' timing is not our timing. Again, another simple lesson, but hard to submit to a lot of times. His timing is not our timing. One person said, Jesus is always late. And I think that's probably a bit of an overstatement, but it gets the point across. Here's Lazarus on the brink of death, and so Jesus waits two days before going to see him. And isn't this what we see so often in our, in our own lives? We find ourselves in the midst of a difficult time, and we pray, Lord, I need help, and I need it now. And the Lord says, okay, I'll be there in a few days. All right, I'll be there in six months. I'll be there in ten years. Many times that's how it is. Jesus will wait until the situation gets even worse. And then he'll show up. And that way he can get all the more glory for triumphing over it. And we can learn lessons of patience, long-suffering, and faith. Lessons that you cannot learn if Jesus caters to you like a genie in a bottle whose sole reason for existence is to answer your every wish at the drop of a hat. See, if you have a genie in a bottle, you don't need patience and faith and long-suffering. Boom, he's there, and he's there for you, right? Your wish is my command. Well, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. His timing is not our timing. From our perspective, it might seem like Jesus is always late, but from his perspective, he's never late. Just like Gandalf tells Frodo in the Fellowship of the Ring, a wizard is never late, Frodo Baggins, nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. <laughs> precisely when he means to. And the Lord Jesus Christ always arrives precisely when he means to. It's often the case that his timing is not our timing, but he arrives when he means to, not always when we want him to. So, first lesson, Jesus is in control of our life circumstances. Secondly, his timing is not our timing, at least the vast majority of the time, it seems like. But thirdly, going a little deeper here, Jesus' timing is motivated by his love. And you've got to get this. His timing is motivated by by his love. And we saw this earlier in the connection between verses 5 and 6. It was because Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus that he stayed where he was and allowed Lazarus to die. It was because he loved them that he stayed. And that cuts right across the grain of a lot of so-called Christian teachers today <laughs> who would tell you that it's always God's will for you to be happy and healthy so you can have your best life now. Well, apparently Lazarus missed the memo on that one because his best life now included getting sick and dying. And contrary to what these false teachers will tell you, Lazarus did not get sick and die because he didn't have enough faith. Lazarus got sick and died because Jesus loved him and his family so much. His timing here was motivated. It was driven by his love for them. 
But you see, this doesn't just cut across the grain of false health and wealth teaching, but it also flips one of the most common objections that people make to Christianity right on its head. People say, if God were really loving, then he wouldn't allow bad things to happen to people. He wouldn't allow people to suffer. Right? You've heard that. We've all heard that. But Jesus turns this completely around, <laughs> flips the thing right on its head in John 11. It's precisely because God is loving that he allows difficult things to happen to people. Now, I don't, I don't expect that answer to please my atheist friends, but that's the Bible's answer. It's precisely because God is loving that he allows difficult things to happen to people. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so he stayed two days longer. And that's not an easy pill to swallow, but it's right there on the face of the text. Again, his timing was motivated and driven by his love for them. And we need to be reminded of this, beloved, because when we are in the midst of difficult times, again, when you're... When that, that pain hits you, when that hurt hits you, and you can hardly even think rationally, the devil will come in that time because you are an easy prey. And the first thing that he will get you to do is to doubt God's love for you. Lord, if you love me so much, why is this happening? Right? And Jesus responds, it's precisely because I love you that this is happening. Does that make the pain any easier? Not really. Does it make the trial any easier? Maybe in, in a while it will. But it's truth that you've got to cling to regardless of how you feel. Because it's true, it's reality. It's exactly what we sing about in the hymn day by day, isn't it? Day by day and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here, trusting in my Father's wise bestowment. I have no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, lovingly, it's part of pain or pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting, ere to take as from a father's hand. Right? Toil, trouble, Lord, I'll take that. As if it was coming to me directly from the hand of my father above, because it is coming directly to me from the hand of my father above. Ere to take as from a father's hand. One by one, the days, the moments fleeting, till I reach the promised land. Our toils and troubles come from the hand of our Heavenly Father, from the hand of the one whose heart is kind beyond all measure. Behind our trouble and suffering is a heart motivated by love. And that's exactly what we see here in John 11. Jesus' timing is motivated by his love. Lastly on this point, another way to look at this is because Jesus loves us, he desires what's best for us. Right? I mean, isn't that what love is, really, in large measure? You say you love someone. To love someone means you desire what's best for them. Right? But according to Jesus, what is best for us is obviously not the complete absence of suffering in our lives. It's not. It can't be. Because if that were the case, we wouldn't have any. Because remember, he's in control of circumstances. Works all things after the counsel of his will. If the best thing for us was to have a complete absence of suffering, we wouldn't have any suffering. Well, that's not what's best for us. That's not the most loving thing for God to do for us, clearly. No, the trials and tribulations and suffering serve a higher purpose. They are the tools that our loving Lord uses to strengthen our faith and to show us His glory. And that leads into the fourth lesson this morning. Lesson number four, if we stick with Jesus through the trials, 
our faith will be strengthened and we will see the glory of God. If we stick with Him through our trials, our faith will be strengthened and we will see the glory of God. Remember what Jesus told His disciples here in verse 14. Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Now, Jesus obviously was not glad about Lazarus' death as a thing in itself. We'll see that later. But he was glad to have the opportunity to use Lazarus' death and ultimately Lazarus' resurrection as a means to strengthen the disciples' faith. Verse 15, I am glad for your sakes, Jesus tells the disciples, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may believe. And we see the fulfillment of this after Lazarus is raised, don't we? In verse 45, Therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done, believed in him. Faith. And so I say again that if we stick with Christ through the trials, our faith will be strengthened. And don't think for a minute that this wasn't a trial for Jesus' disciples. Obviously, this was a trial for Lazarus and for his family, obviously. But it was a trial for the disciples, too. How so? Put yourself in the shoes of the disciples for a minute. Over and over, they had seen firsthand how the love and kindness and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ overflowed in unhesitating mercy towards those in need. Over and over again, they'd seen that. In John 2, they run out of wine at the wedding in Cana, so Jesus makes more wine, unhesitatingly. Does it? After talking with the Samaritan woman in John 4, a bunch of Samaritans come to Jesus. They ask him to stay in their city. And he goes, stays, two days. No problem. At the end of John 4, a nobleman pleads with Jesus to heal his son. So Jesus heals him with a word. He heals the man at the pool of Bethesda in John 5. He feeds the 5,000 in John 6. He heals a man born blind in John 9, all without hesitation. And the disciples, of course, are there witnessing all of that firsthand, seeing it with their own eyes. But then you come to John 11, and the disciples are standing there as a messenger rushes up to tell Jesus that his friend Lazarus is sick and needs his help. And Jesus, who had never before hesitated when it came to helping someone in need, suddenly hesitates. And rather than rush off to help Lazarus, he stays put and lets Lazarus die. And the disciples must have been wondering what in the world was going on here. What is Jesus doing? This isn't like him. Doesn't he love Lazarus and his family? Why doesn't he go and help them? And it must have been a severe trial to their faith and to their understanding of Jesus' character. It just seems so out of character for the Lord to do that. But what the disciples didn't realize at the time was that Jesus had everything under control. In fact, now get this, Jesus was going to use the very thing that was such a trial to their faith to actually strengthen their faith by raising Lazarus from the dead. And isn't that what He does with us? The very thing, beloved, the very thing that is such a trial to your faith is the very thing that He uses to strengthen your faith in the end. They stuck with Jesus in the midst of the trial, even when they didn't understand exactly what He was doing or why He was doing it. But because they stuck with Him, their faith ended up being strengthened in the end. And if we stick with Him, we'll find our faith being strengthened as we follow Him, even when we don't understand at the time exactly what He's doing or why He's doing it. And let's be frank, most of the time we don't when we're in the midst of trials. It's pretty hard to always see the thread and to trace the thread and to see, okay, this is what He's doing. This happened and this and this. I can see exactly what God's doing with all of this. I mean, 
Most of the time, that's not the way it is, right? It's like, what is he doing? Why? Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. The disciples must have been bewildered as to what Jesus was doing and why he was doing it when he let Lazarus die. But when he manifested his glory and Lazarus comes lumbering out of that tomb, then they understood and their faith was strengthened. And beloved, when that happened, no one was standing around going, yeah, but I kind of wish he wouldn't have let him die in the first place. You don't do that. When the Lord Jesus Christ manifests his glory, mouths are shut. And you say, yes, Lord, you were right. You were right. This was the best way to handle this situation. <laughs> but secondly, on this point, if we stick with Jesus through the trials, we will not only find our faith strengthened, but we will also get to see the glory of God. And look again at what Jesus tells Martha in verse 39. Jesus said, Remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? You will see the glory of God. Remember, Jesus loved Martha. He loved her so much that he lets her brother die in order to give her something that is even greater than a healthy sibling. Do you hear me? He loves Martha so much that he lets her brother die in order to give her something that's greater, infinitely greater than a healthy brother. Namely, a revelation of his glory in raising Lazarus from the dead. Yes, she gets her brother back. Amen. But that's not Jesus' ultimate gift to her. If getting Lazarus back was the main thing, then Jesus wouldn't have let him die in the first place. Just like the people said in verse 37, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man also from dying? Yeah, they got it. Of course he could have kept him from dying. Right? They understood. Of course he could have. But Jesus wanted to do something greater and more loving for Martha than simply healing her brother. He wanted to show Martha his glory. And beloved, I don't know about you, but I feel like for me, this is, a, this is a word that I need to hear. This is a word that I need to be teaching my children. That the glory of God is more valuable than anything in this world. Health, wealth, anything. Lack of trials, everything's going great. What is any of that worth? If you don't have the glory of God, the glory of God is more valuable than anything else. That's the lesson here. He wanted to show Martha, and other people there obviously, his glory. The ultimate gift that Martha received was a revelation of the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. That was his ultimate gift of love to Martha and to Mary. <laughs> and ultimately to Lazarus too a glimpse of his glory, a greater unfolding of his power. Lazarus, come forth, and he comes forth. A greater unfolding of his authority, his communion with the Father. Father, I know that you hear me always. Right? A greater unfolding of his tenderness. Unwrap him. Bring him out. And beloved, if we stick with the Lord in the midst of our tribulations, the same will be true of us. He will orchestrate circumstances in our life, hard circumstances, in order to give us the opportunity to see His glory in a way that we would not otherwise. It usually doesn't happen in our way or in our timing or the way that we would choose, but if we walk with Him by faith, He will use trials to direct us to His glory, to bring us closer to Himself, 
to reveal things about himself that can only be revealed in the furnace of affliction. And to illustrate this, I really like this quote. This is from Johnny Erickson Tata, who a lot of you know was paralyzed from the shoulders down in 1967 in a diving accident. She was getting ready to dive into the Chesapeake Bay to go swimming. She misjudged the depth of the water and jump dives in and is paralyzed from that point on from the shoulders down. And she wrote this in a booklet a few years ago. And in the context here, she's talking about how part of her wish is that she could take her wheelchair with her to heaven. Of course, she's been wheelchair bound ever since 1967. Uh, but that's the context. She's talking about how in some way she wishes that she could bring her wheelchair with her to heaven so that she could say this to the Lord Jesus. Jesus, do you see that wheelchair? You were right when you said that in this world we would have trouble because that thing was a lot of trouble. <laughs> but the weaker I was in that thing, the harder I leaned on you. And the harder I leaned on you, the stronger I discovered you to be. It never would have happened had you not given me the bruising of the blessing. And I love that phrase, the bruising of the blessing of that wheelchair. She's thanking the Lord for paralyzing her. That's what she's doing. You say, I could never do that. Don't doubt the grace of God. <laughs> He's able to take you through even a trial that severe and have you come out on the other side thanking Him for the wheelchair. And isn't it true, beloved, that you never learn how strong the Lord Jesus is until you're forced to lean on Him in a way that you would not be forced otherwise. The bruising of the blessing. So if you find yourself in these days in the thick of a difficult circumstance, cling to Christ. Cling to Him. He's allowing it, beloved, in your life because He loves you. Not because He's angry. Not because He's dropped the ball. Not because He's forsaken you. No, it's just the opposite. It's because He loves you. He wants what's best for you. To strengthen your faith and to show you his glory in a way that he could not apart from this hard providence. Whatever bruising of the blessing he has you going through right now, that's the purpose of it. And don't forget the bigger picture as well. We zoom out a little bit. So we're kind of been talking about individual trials here, but zoom out a little bit. All of the bruisings that we experience in this life, all of them together, are working together to prepare us for the ultimate blessing, that of being with Christ forever, seeing His glory face to face. John 17, 24, Father, I desire that they also whom You have given Me be with Me where I am so that they may see My glory. Jesus praying for His disciples. That's where you're headed, beloved. That's where you are headed. And don't ever forget that. And the bruisings of this life are all of them working together to prepare you for that. They are the hammer and the chisel that God is using to mold you and to shape you into a vessel that can experience the glory of Christ forever and ever in a way that you could not otherwise. That's what these trials are doing in this life. Shaping us, molding us into a vessel that can experience glory in a way that we would not otherwise if we just flew through life on a flowery bed of ease. Well, so far then, we've covered four lessons. One, that Jesus is in control of our life circumstances. Two, that His timing is not our timing. Three, that His timing is motivated by His love. And then four, if we stick with Him through the trials, our faith will be strengthened. We will see the glory of God. And then lastly, the fifth lesson, we'll close with this. Lesson number five. Jesus is not indifferent to our suffering in the midst of the trial. He's not indifferent to our suffering in the midst of the trial. 
Because if we're not careful, we can get the wrong impression from this account, can't we? <laughs> After all, here's Jesus letting people die cavalierly. I'm glad Lazarus died, right? Coldly manipulating people like pawns on a chessboard. Martha's weeping. Mary's weeping. The crowd is weeping. Jesus stoically makes His way to the tomb cold and unfeeling, right? Is that the way it was? No. Nothing could be further from the truth. Listen again, verse 32. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw Him, fell at His feet, saying to Him, Lord, if You had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, He was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. Deeply moved. Stirrings in his chest, feeling the emotion of the situation. Verse 34, and said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. Verse 33, again, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. Verse 35, Jesus wept. He wept. And here in two words, beloved, is a lifetime of meditation. Jesus wept. God wept. Remember, he's the brightest and clearest revelation to us of what God is like. And here he is, weeping. And he didn't just squeeze out a single well-calculated tear in order to prove to the people that he had some emotion. No. He wept. You know what that's like. We're talking weeping, racking sobs. He wept. Yes, he will orchestrate trials and sufferings in our life. Yes, he does it for his own glory and for our ultimate good, but He is not indifferent. He is not indifferent to the hurt and the pain that you feel as you go through it. He does not mock your tears. He joins them with His own. And if that seems too incredible to you for the ruler of the universe to sympathize like that, remember again what we said at the beginning. That's why I started the way that I did. Remember that He is the brightest and clearest revelation to us of what God is like. And two, remember that He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Jesus of John 11 is the same Jesus who is seated right now on the throne of the universe. The sympathizing Jesus as we sing in our hymn. Well, amen. I hope those are, are valuable to you. It's the, the kind of message that may not apply necessarily to you right now in the immediate, but I promise you it will apply at some point in the near future. Um, it will, and I hope that the Lord will take some of these, these truths and, and help you to navigate through those waters when that time comes. Well, amen.